In this video, we're going to discuss the HR diagram and how it can be used to determine the properties or analyze the properties of stars that we observe. Some properties of stars are pretty easy to measure. The apparent magnitude, how bright a star appears to us, the color of a star, whether it's blue or red, we can look at a star's spectrum, and if a star is in a visual binary system, we can actually observe the star's motion and uh, determine their orbit. From these, we can determine some other properties for stars, such as temperature, luminosity, mass of a star, if it's in a binary system, and the chemical composition of a star. We can also, de we can also determine the size given the temperature and the luminosity. But how do we put it all together? It turns out that astronomers use a diagram called the HR diagram, and its development began in the 19th century. Late in the 19th century, in the mid to late 1800s, astronomers were developing a classification scheme for stars, and they wanted to classify as many stars as possible based on the appearance of the photographic spectrum for stars. And one of, the first, uh, w one of the first ways of doing this involved ordering the stars by looking at the prominence of the hydrogen absorption lines in the stellar spectrum. And in the, one of the very first classification schemes, uh, stars were given letters, A, all the way down through the alphabet, and the most prominent hydrogen absorption lines were uh, in the A portion. And then later on, a couple female astronomers, particularly Annie Jump Cannon and Antony Amari, decided to get rid of most of the letters, subsume them into only seven letters, within the previous classification scheme, and then reorder the letters according to the temperature of the stars. When they did this, the classification scheme looks like this. Here are seven photographic spectra that correspond to the seven spectral classes of stars that astronomers still use today. O-type, B, A, F, G, K, and M. Notice that the appearance of the absorption lines in the spectra are very different from one spectral class to another. And by looking at the relative strengths of the absorption lines in the spectrum, not the position of the lines, but the relative strengths of the absorption lines, an astronomer could determine the surface temperature of the star. At the time, Annie Jump Cannon and Antony Amari did not know why the order of the stars appeared the, this way according to temperature. That came later. And so, before this, a lot of astronomers thought that the spectral lines were due to subtle differences in the chemical abundance that were uh, of atoms in the atmospheres of stars. However, the best explanation for the differences in the strengths of the, of the absorption lines came from an Indian physicist named Saha. He developed a thermal uh, ionization theory that allowed astronomers to understand why some absorption lines appeared stronger and some appeared weaker depending on the temperatures of the atmospheres of stars. So Saha was the first person uh, to do this and then to apply it to stellar atmospheres. What this allowed us to figure out is that at high degrees of temperature, at high degrees of ionization, you're not going to get as strong of absorption lines as you might at uh, lower degrees of ionization. It's a little bit more complicated than that, but for now, that's where we can begin. Higher temperatures mean more ionization, and lower temperatures mean less ionization. And at low temperatures, you can also have molecule formation. And uh, in the absorption spectra of some of these stars, 
uh, molecule absorption lines also appear. It turns out that using this system, you can determine the temperature of a star even more accurately than you were able to before by looking at the peak wavelength of the star's blackbody curve. One of the other things uh, that was done was to examine the star's spectra and determine the uh, uh, relative abundance of the main elements in a star. One of the first people to do this was Cecilia Payne Gapashkin, and she got her PhD from Harvard. She did a thesis in astronomy, and she determined that uh, the sun was made mostly of hydrogen. So what do we get from all of this? we get a theoretical explanation for the classification scheme and we get evidence that uh, the that it's temperature changes or temperature differences in stars that give you the different strengths in the absorption lines and we also get research that tells us about what elements are in the stars we also get a good classification system that will come in handy a little bit later. And we get a second way to determine the temperature of stars. So here are the spectral classes again. O, B, A, F, G, K, and M. O-type stars are the hottest, greater than 25,000 Kelvin in temperature. Then B, then A, F, G-type stars are stars that have a surface temperature somewhere between 5 and 6,000 Kelvin. Our sun has a surface temperature of around 5,800, and so that would make it a G-type star. The coolest stars, that is the lowest stars in surface temperature, are the M-type stars. These stars can be broken up into subdivided classes. So an O0 type star would be the hottest O type star, and an O9 type star would be the coolest. So you can go from O0 to O1, O2, O3, and so on. And then you can have the hottest B type star would be a B0, then a B1, then B2, then B3. Our sun is a G2 classification. So this is the classification scheme. There's seven letters to represent the different spectral types. O, B, A, F, G, K, M. It goes from hottest to coolest, bluish to reddish. And you're going to need to know the order of spectral classes. So it's important to remember. It used to be that people would memorize the order of the spectral classes by using a mnemonic that goes like this. O, B, A, fine guy or girl, kiss me. So O, B, A, F, G, K, M. However, there's a few other mnemonics that you might use. For example, overseas broadcast, a flash, Godzilla kills Mothra. It's still O, B, A, F, G, K, M. Over budget adult films give nights merriment. Or, one boring afternoon, Frank grew killer marijuana. I'm not endorsing any of these practices, but mnemonics are most effective when they're funny and memorable. And so, use whatever mnemonic you like, but you'll need to know that the or order of the spectral types goes from O, B, A, F, G, K, and M. If we look at all the nearby stars we can, we can determine things like their luminosity, their temperature, their size, and their distances. And what are the relationships between these things? We can ask questions such as, are more luminous stars always larger? And what combination of temperature and luminosity are possible? To answer these questions, we look at something called the HR diagram which was developed independently by two astronomers, Hertzsprung and Russell. And it's a graph of the luminosity versus temperature or absolute magnitude versus spectral class. You've actually seen this before when we discussed luminosity. 
So here's an example HR diagram with luminosity versus spectral class, with luminosity getting greater as you go uh, higher on the y-axis, and then spectral class arranged from hottest on the left to coolest on the right. And each of the dots that we see in this HR diagram represent some star uh, with these properties. The sun is a G2, so if we go over to the G, on the hotter end of the G types, we go, we, the, that's where the sun will be, and then a sun's luminosity would be well, about one solar luminosity. It turns out that the sun is in this band of stars called the main sequence. And then there's also red giants and white dwarfs. Another way of representing the HR diagram would be like this, where I have luminosity on a y-axis, but it's parallel to uh, absolute magnitude, because those two things correlate together. The brighter an absolute magnitude, the brighter a luminosity. Also, spectral class correlates to temperature, so hotter temperatures go with spectral classes such as O and B. The thing I like about this particular diagram is that it shows that there are more main sequence stars than there are, uh, I'm sorry, uh, more cool main sequence stars than there are hot main sequence stars. First, let's talk about red giants. These are stars that are extremely big. They're not very hot in surface temperature, but they're very bright. So consider Betelgeuse, 3,500 Kelvin, but it's 100,000 times more luminous than the sun. What this means is that the radius must be about a thousand times the sun's. It's so large that with a telescope, you, you can actually measure the diameter of Betelgeuse. If you were to place a star like Betelgeuse, a red giant, into our solar system, the edges would go beyond the orbit of Mars. Red giants are found in the upper right-hand corner of the HR diagram, so above and to the right of the main sequence. Then there's white dwarfs. These are stars that are very small, extremely hot, but not very bright. So consider Sirius B. This is a star that has 27,000 Kelvin for surface temperature, but it's a thousand times less luminous than the sun. What this means is that it's very small. It's a hundred times smaller than the sun. Something that's comparable in size to a white dwarf would be the Earth. The Earth is also a hundred times smaller than the sun. White dwarfs are not very luminous at all. And so in order to see them, you need uh, very sensitive telescopes. So for example, this is a uh, star cluster called M4. And using a sensitive telescope such as the Hubble Space Telescope, we can start finding white dwarfs, and they're circled here. Very difficult to find. White dwarfs are found in the lower left portion of the HR diagram. They're uh, lower and to the left of the main sequence. How do we determine the sizes of stars on the HR diagram? This is something that you've practiced with before. If something has a low temperature but is very high in luminosity, it must be very large in size. And this means that red giants and supergiants are the biggest stars that exist. Even a comparable luminosity for a main sequence star would not be as large because if a star has the same luminosity and its main sequence that is very hot as something that is a red giant, then the red giant has to be larger in order to make up for its lower temperature. A white dwarf has to be very small in order for it to be both hot but also very low in luminosity. Main sequence stars can be cool or hot, they can be large or small, and they can be low in luminosity or high in luminosity. They can be combinations of these. And it turns out that main sequence stars that are low in temperature and low in luminosity are also the smallest main sequence stars. The largest main sequence stars are 
the highest in luminosity and the highest in temperature. This is a way that we can start to uh, look at different types of stars using this diagram. Before, we only looked at the sizes of stars, but there's more things that we can use the HR diagram for. We can use it to tell us about the ages of stars, uh, where a star at is in its evolutionary state, and we can use it to determine how long a star will last.